don't want a quiet room right now. All right, we'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, we're moving on to item 7C, Falcony status update. Chief of Wildlife Diversity with Laura Richards. Uh, we'll provide an update on pending Falcony regulations. Laura? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the commission, I'm Laura Richards, the Chief of the Wildlife Diversity Division. I'm going to give a little update um, on the process and the timeline to align the state falconry regulations with federal falconry regulations. As many of you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service revised the federal regulations regarding falconry. INDA has drafted amendment language to Nevada Administrative Code governing the practice of falconry in Nevada. This effort is required to align the state regulations with the revised federal regulations. The states have until 2014 to have their new regulations approved by the Fish and Wildlife Service for the continued licensing of falconry in our state. Last summer, um, we held a series of public scoping meetings to present the draft uh, regulation language for review and input by the falconers. In addition, we posted the proposed language on our website, and folks that weren't able to come to the uh, scoping meetings were able to provide written comments to us as well. Uh, based on those scoping meetings, the um, endowed team of um, license office, the law enforcement division staff, and also wildlife diversity division staff began revising the draft regulations based on that feedback that we got from the falconers at those scoping meetings. Some of the major changes that we agreed to based on the input that we got from the falconers um, included moving uh, the minimum apprentice falconer age back from 12 um, from 14 to, to 12 from 14, uh, moving the minimum age for a general falconer from 18 to 16, um, Endow incorporated, incorporated the Code of Federal Regulation, or CFR, banding requirements and dropped the state requirements for all species to be banded. We also incorporated CFR language on the species that may be possessed by an apprentice falconer. These uh, revised regulations were sent back to LCB, Legislative Council Bureau, for review and approval, and they were recently uh, sent back to Endow for final review. Um, Endow plans to submit this regulation for an agenda item um, later this year, hopefully at the December Commission meeting, uh, for approval, and um, this will allow, again, for additional public input. Following Commission approval, the regulation will be sent to the Legislative Commission or their subcommittee to review regulations for approval. We're all um, required as well uh, to update our falconry uh, database and also to update our exam for falcon falconers, and we're in the process of doing that. Um, Corey Dalton and Frank Ely uh, from the falconry community are helping us um, revise that exam, so we appreciate um, their help with us on that. Endow's goal is to have the final approved regulation submitted to the Fish and Wildlife Service in early 2013. Uh, we remain on track to have the state regulations aligned to the federal regulations well before the 2014 deadline. Um, it did take a while for LCB to review those regulations. They're, they're fairly extensive. So it did uh, delay us coming back and presenting um, these regulations to the commission. But the timing is, is um, probably too early for the September commission meeting. We'd like to send uh, the draft regulations off to George Allen of the Fish and Wildlife Service, who oversees this whole program um, for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and he can ensure that we have captured all the requirements, that we won't have any red flags once it comes to you. We know the Fish and Wildlife Service has said it looks good, and so um, we should be able to do that by the December Commission meeting. We look forward to working with the falconry community over the coming weeks as these revised Regulations are finalized to ensure that the revised regulations are both in keeping with the needs of Nevada's falconers and also the responsible uh, conservation of the falconry resource. So I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have on that. I have one. Commissioner Rain. Uh, thank you. What uh, requests from falconers were not included in the, what did they ask for that he didn't incorporate into the regulations we are going to see. Um, most of the major changes that they requested, we did um, make those changes, and I, I hit on most of those. Um, there was still some discussion about Peregrine Falcon, 
and um, Golden Eagle, and um, we're still kind of working on that. Um, but those are some things that we're still kind of working on internally about that. So they're requesting that Peregrine Falcons and Golden Eagles be allowed? We heard that the Peregrine Falcon was, was a possibility that they would, would like to see. Okay. And what other, anything else that they were asking for that they haven't gotten in? I, I, as far as I know, that that's the, the main issues that were still out there. Because yes. I'm just, you know, thinking that anticipation of, you know, if the Falconers show up and they got everything they wanted, we're going to have about a two-second meeting when that comes around. Yes, I hope so. So, so you know, if we can, you know, hash out those differences mm -hmm. now, you won't have to worry about them later. So that's basically it. It's maybe Ferengrel Falcon and possibly Golden right. Eagle. And yes, that, and oh, I'm sorry. And that is from like master falconers or at any level or what was the deal on those um there's different levels uh, you know of, of training and how long the apprentice versus the, the master uh, falconer has to have and we pretty much have gone forward with the, f the federal framework on that okay and so um you know when, when it was sent to lcb they do like to rearrange where where the order is on some of the regulations uh, we spent quite a bit of time reviewing the regulations to, to make sure that the intent hadn't changed and we're we're pretty confident that that's the case. We're, we have a couple of questions that we have for LCB uh, remaining, but we, we think we'll have that resolved in the next week or so. Okay, so there's basically going to have no argument with anything we have when they come up. And, you're, and we're going to meet with, with some folks, too, once we do have uh, the draft back okay. from the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and kind of sit down one last time. Rob and I said we'd, we'd be glad to, to sit back down and, and have any any questions answered at that time as well. Those are the people I'm on commission much. I know there's only very few falconers. Do you have a number of rough, how many? It's less than 60 licensed falconers. So we're just talking this very smallest group and every meeting we've had in the past, they basically, Endow has basically said they have no impact on anything. So it's, that would be the summation of everything. So we might as well go with what they want. It's a sport that could stand to grow a little bit. <laughs> I'm good. Anybody else? Okay, hey, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next agenda item, uh, 7D, Governor Sage Grouse Advisory Committee update. Uh, I'm going to give an update on the Governor Sage Grouse Committee. Uh, that committee went away July 31st, about 20 minutes to 5. We concluded our business that needed to be wrapped up that day. Uh, I was hoping JJ was going to be here today. He was also a committee member. And Ken, chime in anytime you have uh, something to add. But the committee we met 11 days in Carson City. Uh, tons of presentations that were very uh, informative. Uh, great cooperation from uh, Ted Cook, U.S. Fish and Wildlife State Director. Uh, Amy and uh, Raul from BLM were present at the majority of the meetings for the entire meeting, offered uh, helpful input, uh, trying to help us put together a plan that would, in the end, be defensible. Uh, what we're looking at, uh, a lot of people think that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service makes a determination on warranted or not warranted on listing of, of a species. And at our conclusion, uh, what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does is take all the input from both sides and they make a decision and it really comes down to a judge in a courtroom that makes the final decision whether the evidence presented is sufficient to say one way or the other. So you have to present evidence and, and we are uh, uh, doing our best to uh, come up with some ways to have the state of Nevada gather evidence uh, with Department of Wildlife. Uh, from a sportsman viewpoint, I was probably a broken record and a thorn in the side of a couple people in there. Uh, they never came after hunting one time. From the people sitting on uh, the committee side of the table, hunting was never brought up a single time uh, as a limiting factor or something we need to consider. And we had pretty much, we had ranching, ag, mining, power, conservation groups, general public, and local counties represented. And 
and hunting never came up. It came up from the general public a couple times, and uh, I tried to address that as well as I could, uh, stating what the sportsmen of the state of Nevada have paid into uh, the science that we're relying on to keep the bird off the list, and also the benefits of uh, what the sportsmen have given, and the Pittman Robinson money, and uh, pretty much everything that funds what we're doing to keep this bird off the list has been paid for by sportsmen. I know there was a couple people on the committee that would take exception to that when I'd say that, but uh, that's my belief, and, and uh, I believe we have the dollars uh, on record to back up that belief. So I was not shy in, in saying that the sportsmen have handled this. Uh, the other thing, uh, the committee, we would get to points, and they would want to uh, say, well, we need this science, we need to do this, we need to do track this and keep going and and every time one of those would come up they'd look at the department and uh, I would say uh, if the department does that how are we going to fund that uh, the sportsmen have a limited resource and, and we, we have uh, shown even on the bi-state population I brought that up as an example we haven't hunted that bi-state population in 15 years and, and we're approving heritage projects for the bi-state population. Uh, we were challenged, why don't we close hunting season? I, I told them we have closed hunting season in uh, five entire counties, 22 hunt units. So where we recognize that they're a little bit on the edge, we have closed hunting season. Uh, those are, you know, the sportsmen are doing the right things. We're stepping up, spending our money and uh, doing what we can to help save the listing of the bird. Uh, we've come up with some definitions of the occupied habitat, potential habitat, non-habitat, and connective link habitat. Uh, this is crucial in the plan. Uh, I believe through the proposed listing of this bird, I think the state of Nevada and pretty much all of the West has a tremendous opportunity here to seek federal funding and, and seek different revenue sources to help out the sagebrush ecosystem. Uh, anything we can do to help out our environment, uh, you know, treatment of evasive seeds, uh, species, pinion juniper encroachment, uh, the, the biggest threats that we have. If we can help combat that with help of federal partners, uh, it's only going to help us out. And I, I think this bird listing, potential bird listing, is going to be the catalyst that helps us start doing some of this PJ removal and, and different things on cheatgrass. I, I, I'm hoping in the end it's a positive. Uh, we had good cooperation from the mining companies. Uh, it, it, came to light that they're they're doing quite a bit of, on their side uh, they're they're buying private land holdings they're they're looking ahead to better position themselves in the future uh, the livestock industry we, we had quite a talk with the livestock industry and JJ uh, did a good job representing the livestock industry uh, some of the best tools that we have to help out the bird is proper grazing, seasonal grazing. Uh, if we use grazing in the right manner at the right time, uh, we can provide the proper cover. We can get rid of old brush that isn't providing the proper cover. There's, there's so many positives that can come with grazing in the right way. Uh, we just need to make sure that it occurs in the right way. And, and the other thing, uh, we can't manage the grazing of uh, wild horses. And so, uh, you know, we can't tell them they have seasonal use or you can't be in this riparian area at this time. And so uh, we, we've put down that the wild horses are uh, uh, a limiting factor also. So uh, going through the limiting factors, uh, number one is basically fire and invasive species that came out of our committee. Uh, what, what we came to a conclusion is we have too much fire in the north, which is occurring today, and not enough fire in the south. Uh, 
PJ's taken over the south and fire's taken over the north. So if we could move our fire out of one end and put it in the other, it might help us out, but it's not cooperating. So uh, we can't get there. Uh, Pinion Juniper, let's see, that Pinion Juniper was number two. Uh, predation, I know that that's been a big topic here at the Wildlife Commission and uh, in papers in Elko and Eureka County about the Wildlife Commission's position on predation. Uh, this committee, the Governor's Committee, uh, predation is 6.3, which means it's higher on the list. Uh, through Dr. Coates's presentation, it became very evident where the predation is coming from. Uh, it's coming through ravens and crows, and and uh, I know that it's been talked about that there were studies about nesting survival in the past and putting eggs out and everything that's been done in the past. And uh, with the new technology out there, Dr. Coates has it. Uh, the, the ravens don't come and hit the nest. They don't find the eggs and come get the nest. They uh, they watch the hen. And they just keep an eye on that hen. When the hen sits, he has video. I don't know where he got a camera small enough to fit in the nest, but he's got one. And he has video of uh, as soon as the hen sits down, Raven will hit the hen off the, the nest and then take the eggs. So that's, that's the lion's share of the uh, predation that we that, that is documented at this point. Uh, wild horses and burrows. Uh, Can I make one comment? Yeah, go ahead. Really important there. He also has cameras in various levels of cover, and for every 1% increase in cover, you saw a comparable decrease in the raven predation. And when you got to 40% cover, ravens went away because they couldn't make a living. So the, the, the point is that going to do predator control you need to try to be doing the habitat work right along with it otherwise you can't really ever catch up with it because there's six to eight weeks of depredation on sage grouse and the rest of it is all the reproduction and the and the food resources available to ravens they just replace themselves and you continue with the with the problems like finger in the dike yeah and uh, the other thing on the predation and, and the ravens it it's documented that they, they can't make a living on our sage grouse, but they're making a living on dump sites and roadkill. And so somewhere we need to start controlling uh, landfills. And uh, as a side note, I'm going to get into it here at Wafa. Other states have contractors that go out and pick up and document roadkill. That is their total job. They have contractors assigned to just drive highways and pick up roadkill and document it and get it off the highways. And Nevada has nothing like that. I don't know where we'd fund it, but uh, uh, that, that is being used in other western states. Uh, getting back to this, so wild horse and burrows, that was our 6.4. Uh, that means it's pretty high on the list. Uh, livestock and grazing, it's 6.5, but the way the plan was put together, uh, it wasn't, I, I, if you read the draft plan, and it hasn't been signed by the governor yet, uh, we looked at utilizing existing uh, grazing and, and utilizing it the right way to uh, benefit the sage grouse and, and uh, make sure that we're all working together. And, and uh, JJ said that he's been doing it. It's been successful as a ranch operator and been successful on the range to help out the sage grouse. So uh, that, that was encouraging. Uh, just going through the list here. 6.6, .6, mining and exploration. What do you think? Probably 50% of our time was spent on mining. Most of the general public in the audience uh, were mining representatives. Uh, different stages of mining. We had some mining exploration people. We had some small mining company, Mineral Alliance people. And then we had the big Barrick and Newmont represented also. Uh, that was, mining was the bulk of the activity. Uh, mining's footprint is small, but when you laid the overlay of where the potential deposits in the state are, 
and where our best habitat is, it, it lines up fairly well. Uh, so when, when you start looking at mining, uh, we really got into the avoid, minimize, and mitigate uh, aspect. And that was the avoid, minimize, and mitigate is pretty much the theme of the uh, committee was figuring out how to avoid, minimize, and mitigate. Uh, and avoid doesn't always mean not do it. Maybe it might be a seasonal operation. We had one mining operator that was looking at doing something. He said, you know, we could mine seasonally and stockpile and, and run it through our processing plant during non-critical times. And uh, I think there was other mining companies that kind of looked at them like, whoa, I can't believe you said that, but they did. Uh, we looked at uh, trying to minimize their requirements when they go in and do exploration. Uh, sometimes the BLM or different agencies have minimum criteria on how you access the site. You have to build a road that does this, you have to do this, you have to do this. And maybe that's not the least impactful. Maybe that's the way that you have in your books, but we're looking for the least impactful way. It might mean uh, accessing five drill sites off of one main road instead of putting in five different roads. It may mean, uh, uh, you know, a longer access road. You might need to travel 10 miles in off another road instead of two miles in, but you're avoiding critical habitat. So uh, that's what we're looking at with mining. Uh, towards the end, I, they, they talked about bringing some money, didn't they, Ken? Uh, because we're looking, our committee was unfunded, and we're trying to get stuff to go forward, and, and everything we have is unfunded at this point. Right. So we had to get funds from NGOs. A uh, power company brought quite a bit of money. Mining brought money. Uh, Cattlemen's Association brought some money. Everybody and, put and in some money. some sportsmen's groups. Do we and then I, checks? I, that's the other thing. When I, I'd like to, since I'm a sportsman, I was a sportsman representative on that committee. I know that uh, Safari Club Northern Nevada ponied up some money. Right I don't see book. Joel. He's not in the room. I know Nevada Trappers Association gave a check to Endell Gift Account, and that's where the money's going through is Endell Gift Account. NBU Reno and Nevada Record Book. Yeah. Uh, all told, when you add it up, it's $4,500, dollars that uh, the, the NGOs brought in themselves to, to get the committee even funded to, so we could do this work. Uh, but mining, it, it, it was 50%, and I, I think that uh, this, this plan was industry-driven. It's to keep the bird off the list to keep industry going. And so, uh, I don't know, Ken, I don't know if it's fair to say. It was, it was the sage grouse plan to keep industry going. It was, we, we, it was as much focused on how we keep industry going as it was the bird, but that's what the plan was about, and that's what the committee was formed to do. Uh, renewable energy and transmission lines and transmission corridors. That was talked about quite a bit, too. Uh, and some interesting things came out about that. Uh, it's been stated that the transmission lines may not be as bad as all the distribution lines we get off the uh, power grid. The transmission lines are set at a height that the birds don't really like to hunt from. They have a height that they like to look at stuff. And, and do their business, and transmission lines are fairly tall, and and uh, the power companies have been fairly good lately. You look at the new construction; they're single structures. They're not a lattice. They're more of a pole type, steel pole type deal, and they're not the lattice which accommodates bird nesting. So uh, they've changed some of their designs. They're trying to do things different. Uh, Jeff Ceccarelli, he represented the power industry, and I think. Uh, he learned as much as anybody on that committee. Uh, he, I think he took a lot of it to heart. Uh, our only problem is Jeff represented him. He'll still be with him, but he retired mid-plan. So he was bringing the power company's message forward. Now we got to work with Jeff and the people he used to work with to get the message from the committee back. That, that's uh, 
only downside, Jeff was tremendous on the committee. I just wish he was had a couple more years with the power company to see that a couple of things we talked about can get into place. But uh, I'm sure if we start stumbling there, we can call Mr. Ceccarelli and he'll help us out there. He, he really bought into what we were doing. Uh, let me look here. And one final thing that went in there, and it wasn't in there originally, and kind of at the ninth hour, uh, it was a suggestion of mine that we need to look at it again, and that is off-highway vehicle use. Uh, I, I don't think there's a hunter, a rancher, a miner, anybody out there that doesn't recognize the number of miles of pioneering roads that we have going in. and. Uh, most of it through our critical habitat. And uh, I, I think that this came to light uh, this year with me. I was on one of my ATVs, and I ended up in the probably middle of 200 sage grouse while I was trying to deer hunt in late December with my son. And all I could think is I really shouldn't be here at this moment. It's pretty cool to see, but they're trying to make a living right now, and it's cold as heck out here and windy. and. All I'm doing is push them out of where they need to be and survive. And I, I think that that's a, uh, a critical thing that we need to look at as sportsmen is how we use our ATVs, use them wisely, and use them at times a year that don't disrupt an animal's ability to make a living. Uh, the other reason I talked about that was it seems like every time we turn around, they're trying to shut down roads that we've historically used with our grandfathers and everything. But then you're hearing of new proposed trails on BLM land, and it seems to go through some of our best habitat. So I wanted that in there kind of to help uh, at least the sportsmen and to hopefully not get these new trails that are proposed in some of these areas that could have a rather large impact on us. seems like we lose on one end, and then they give us trails back that make you lose in a total different way. So uh, that was put in there. And if anybody's to blame for that one, that one's me, and I'll take that responsibility. Uh, go like I stated, the governor hasn't signed this. Uh, right now it's just a draft. Uh, a lot of the stuff the mining company was talk the mining companies were talking about was mitigation. That's down in 8.0. Uh, mitigation was a huge portion. And I, I think that uh, agriculture and ranching really perked up when we started talking about mitigation. Uh, you could see, for example, Lincoln County. When we first met the first day, Bevan pretty much took on Sean and Ken and said, when you guys first talked about this, there was no sage grouse habitat in Lincoln County. Now you have my ranch surrounded. And uh, I don't know how you did that. It wasn't four weeks later when we were doing the mapping exercise that went along with the plan to come up with our management, sage-grouse management areas. We didn't call it core or critical habitat. We wanted to call it something else. So we called it something else other than what other, the other states did. But. Uh, Bevan went from, I don't want it around my farm, to when it came back, they had taken the original map and expanded it in Lincoln County. Because I think Bevan recognized that it was an opportunity to have pinion juniper removed and to have some habitat manipulation occur that would help out the sage grouse, help out the mule deer, and help out the ranching and livestock industry at the same time. Uh, I think that he saw it as a positive, and, and you could see it in the way the maps reflected when they came back. You could see some counties trying to shrink it and some counties trying to grow it, depending on the interpretation their representative brought back to their board on, on how, uh, how it could be used in the future. Some people see it as, you know, if I'm in your management area and it gets listed, you've just shut me down. and. Uh, I'm not, I'm not looking at the bird being listed. I talked to Sandstiver when we were over at Wafa, and his comment to me when I asked him about it, he said 600,000 birds and $200 million either spent or 
ready to be spent on the bird. If you list that bird, there's nothing that can't be listed. Uh, that, those are pretty big numbers, 600000 and $200 million. It's, that seems to be going the right direction. Hopefully we can keep this going and all the governors sign on and we can convince the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and get the uh, science to back up our position so a judge says, yeah, you've done the right thing. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Uh, science and how we get to the science. Uh, I know I was a broken record saying that we need help funding that science, but uh, that's my true belief. Uh, I won't apologize for it. And I, I think that we need people to cooperate and it might not be uh, with dollars, it might be with uh, cooperation to get legislation and get to our congressmen and senators and take a bigger group in to, to make sure we get some of this stuff funded. So that's about all I have on it. I don't know if you want to add anything, Ken. I, I guess the, 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 the last thing I could add is that uh, the purpose of this planning effort was to develop the plan for Nevada that the BLM would insert into their EIS process as an alternative. And I think we're there. They got the draft in there and the maps and, and whatnot. And the governor needs to still review it, and he will pick and choose probably uh, amongst the, that plan and what he's going to move move forward. I hear that um, they will get uh, a group together, agency directors, cabinet-level people, to say, OK, let's put some meat on the bones here because it doesn't it doesn't get into great detail how the stuff is actually going to uh, occur. Uh, for me, the the wild card still is the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Ted Cook um, is a real optimistic uh, kind of person, which is great to work with. Um, I think he's okay with what came out of here, but again, of course, devil's in the details. Um, I think there's something in this plan about a five percent disturbance and occupied. Habitat. I think the department will have something to say about what is occupied habitat based on our, our data. Um, and we're going to need to come up with operationally, what does that mean? Who's going to keep track of it? What happens when it gets to be 5%? What's the committee, the council, that's going to be making the decision yes or no on the development that would be proposed or uh, occur after the 5%? And will the Fish and Wildlife Service accept that as being adequate to conserve the bird through time to keep it off the list. I did have a conversation with the, the national lead uh, for sage grouse, and she's in, in Denver um, yesterday. And I, I, was, I was jabbing her a little bit about their conservation objective team, the COT team. And the COT report is out. I have not seen it. Sean was a member of it. Uh, Sean tells me they really haven't got to the how much is enough yet. And I told her, I said, that's unacceptable because if you don't get there, the states don't know whether 5% is enough. I mean, is that a good enough buffer? It should be 3%. And we'd hate to be targeting 5% and then have you guys come back later and say, no, it's really, you know, three, any more than 3% disturbance in occupied habitat puts the burden at some risk and we're going to list it. I mean, we, we can't have that kind of, we're right at the end here of the game. Um, and she said that they would be working on that. So I mean, there's still some things. I mean, the bottom line is there's some things that still need to be decided, things that are out of our control. I think the committee did a great job. You know, you had myself and the BLM director and Fish and Wildlife Service director at almost every meeting for the whole meeting um, of multiple days, which you just don't see that kind of, you know, participation, quite frankly. So. Yeah, I, I missed. Uh, the second to the last meeting, and, and I'm glad you brought up the occupied habitat. At that meeting, they discussed occupied habitat, and they had they got into the draft at, uh, about being able to call it occupied habitat. It had to be a documented sighting or something that was documented through Endow in the last five years to still consider it occupied. And. Uh, <coughs> We talked about that on the last day when we were trying to come up with the final draft that goes to the governor for signature, and and I took exception to that five years. Uh, and a couple of reasons I took exception to that is uh, we have wilderness areas, we have different areas that we know birds exist, 
and they might not be documented. Because we can't get there. We just can't get there. It might not be wilderness. It just might be remote. But just because we haven't seen them doesn't mean we don't know they exist. The other thing is you start putting the criteria of documented on staff. Uh, I'm looking at the amount of time that uh, Sean puts into documenting things as it is. And it just becomes a huge task for staff to try to keep this catalog of documented, undocumented, and trying to get back to documented areas. Does running around every five years to document every area get us the best science? Or does maybe concentrating on 30% of the habitat, looking at it, and being able to model that statewide, is that our best approach? Uh, I push back on that. I lost, uh, but uh, that five-year thing is going to be tough. And, and I, I put a challenge out. I said, you know, I'm looking at Sean, and he's no longer a biologist. He's going to become a contract administrator because you're saying that he, they're going to uh, maybe hire contractors, a mining company or cattlemen association. Somebody could go hire a contractor and go out and document these birds. But there still has to be a clearinghouse to get all this information into one place. And that clearinghouse is in now, and, and we're the ones footing the bill. And I pushed back a little bit, and like I said, I lost. I wasn't there the first day. I was at WAF instead. Uh, but uh, I wish I could have made a better argument on that because uh, I don't think we get as much help as we need to sometimes. I think we, Alan, you may know the answer. I think it's 1,300 lex that we actually survey. You think about our crew, pretty small, 17 biologists. Got a lot of volunteers even if you in, in 19 million acres and where you think you have lex historically if you just put that on a you're going to visit it every once every five years it, it, unless we get an infusion of, of a lot more money and a lot more people i don't know how you would do it in a five-year context and we need to recognize that the sportsmen are the ones that have been paying that bill um, over the years uh, and then what will the fish and wildlife service accept as is it, uh, is it some mining biologist that has an interest for the mining? See, so we run into those kinds of things of what the service would actually accept as a bona fide yes, it's there, no, it's not. Um, so th those are the kinds of the devils in the details that's got to be worked out. Well, I, I didn't push back because I didn't want the information. I pushed back because I didn't know how we were going to get there. And they said, well, we'd like to get funding. And I'm like, Where's the? F yeah, I I push back because of a personnel and funding issue, and and I, I'd love to get there. It's just uh, I know how hard it is to get to where we're at now, and to hit that window is going to be tough. And I just don't like falling short. I, I think that one place we could fall short. Uh, there is a couple things that are going to come out of this. This plans. The, this committee's done. But uh, the committee did put a recommendation forward to have a sage grouse advisory council and a sage grouse technical team. Uh, I don't know, Ken. Those those are still two unknowns at this point. This yeah. plan hasn't been signed off. There's nobody been assigned to those. They've just been recommendations out of this out of the committee that no longer exists. Uh, and that's where the agencies need to get together and figure out how we pay for this, how we do it, who needs to be involved. If you look at the council, it's got the, it would fill this room with the representatives, and that may be unwieldy. I don't know. Um, I know that's some of the things that the governor's staff is looking at. Um, and then the technical team, well, I only have one Sean Espinosa. Yeah. So we need, we need to find general fund dollars somewhere to help fund this, this effort. Uh, probably the most encouraging thing to happen when it comes to funding at the end of the day uh, on the last Friday that we met uh, it wasn't a Friday but the last day that we met Ted Cook from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came in and he had gone to his supervisors and he secured $40,000 from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to put in a, into an account to help put Nevada's plan forward and get the, the technical team up to running. 
because they, they recognized that there wasn't any money there and uh, they thought that that $40,000 could be well used. So I would have to say the Fish and Wildlife Service is working with us to try to uh, get this plan on the ground and, and get things going forward. Uh, we're going, we basically put a challenge out to everybody that sat on the committee. You represent people. We need to make this thing work to keep Nevada going. We need to go back to our industries and our constituents and come up with a little more money to, to take this next step. Yeah. Uh, Joel, while you were out of the room, I did thank you and the Nevada Trappers Association for the money that you did contribute to the committee. I appreciate that. Uh, at this point, I don't have anything else. If anybody has any questions, Mr. Drew. Yeah, the, the only point that I'd make or suggestion for this commission is, and it probably has to wait until the governor's had a chance to review it and sign off, but at some point there's going to be an implementation strategy going forward, and this commission needs to play a big part in that, whether it's writing letters or recommending things or <coughs> doing things in the legislature, whatever that happens to be. Um, that's something that I know I'm going to be keeping an eye on and something that I'd ask the other commissioners and Director Mayor and Sean and staff, if there's something that we can request or help move along in the implementation of this, we need to know about it and we need to get proactive on it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and that's that's part of it. That's part of the biggest challenge out there um, that's been hanging over the sage grouse stuff has been um, how are you going to make it happen? That's, uh, BLM has said it from day one as you know one of the, you know, there are five major components on their range white plant, and uh, that was probably the biggest one is do you have the, the mechanisms in place to, to make things happen if you have to. And uh, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been at the table for a long time, but they're not, they didn't play the same role that they're playing now. There's been a little bit of a, a change in how they're, uh, how they're, how they're participating in the, in the process. Um, they were there to tell, uh, initially, when the conservation team was in place, um, they were basically there to, to be technical. But when you asked them, uh, "What do you want to see? What it, you know? If what's what's going to put you in a position of denying this? Show us, you know. Tell us this isn't a game. You know, this isn't a us against, against you thing. Tell us what's going to get us over the hump here. And uh, basically, what, what we got most of the time was, um, "We'll know it when we see it." Um, so you're shooting at targets that are in the dark. You have no idea how far out they are. You have no idea if they're to your left, to your right, up, down. Um, so there's a little bit of a change. I can tell you that we had an opportunity to, to talk to um, the gal that's overseeing this, Noreen, Noreen Peterson. Walsh. Walsh. And, and um, she didn't give much up. Um, she didn't want to talk about it a whole lot. Uh, uh, somebody used the phrase uh, cobra at a mon mongoose convention type of thing. But uh, uh, I think the fact that, that her folks or the people involved are, are finding money and are actually trying to, to help facilitate this process is a, is a big push forward. And, and uh, I would really encourage to continue to, to uh, however, however the commission needs to help, to continue to put for the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in the position of saying, this is exactly what we're going to need so that we can shoot towards it. Otherwise, uh, we're shooting in the dark. They know enough to, to tell us what we need to do. and, and uh, I think we're getting closer to them draw, to pulling that out of them. We just need to keep the pressure on and keep asking the question. And, um, you know, I think that's where we need to go. But I, I'm glad where we're at. I, I, let me share you one part of the conversation I have with Noreen. In the COT team recommendations, it, it does some really great things. It, it evaluates every man, sage grass management unit in the West as its, its threat and, and kind of what needs to be done to maintain it through time. And so the, the question I have is that, that in that report, then, it says, do everything necessary to maintain the integrity of this through time. I said, Noreen, what's the target? How do you do it? That's the $64,000 question. She goes, oh, I know. But the scientists don't have definitive science and didn't want to get put in a corner to make that decision. I said, well, then who's going to make it? You guys behind a, a locked door with a smoke-filled room and the Ouija board like you've always done it? And she started laughing. She goes, well, yeah, if you put it that way. I said, so if in your own defense, you need to go back to the COT team and say, okay, guys, we understand this is hard, but who better 
to tell us how much is enough based on what you know. Because they all know that we're going to get sued by, you know, Western Watersheds and Wild Earth Guardians and those. And then those scientists are going to be standing there in, in the court trying to explain how they took science in one drainage and applying it in another location. So this is a very difficult issue, and and uh, the mongoose and the it, it is uh, cobra is, is a good example. But I think we're going to get there. Just a matter, of, we got people got to be pushing them to, to do the right thing. Does that does that make sense? Uh, it makes total sense to me. Yeah. Briefly, Commissioner Rain. On the roadkill issue, you know, it's interesting to mention that in other states, some people get paid for. My understanding, I, I had this question came up a little more than a year ago, different subject. But it was still roadkill, and I was asking the regional supervisor over a couple county. I think he's recently uh, retired now, but he said that, you know, what what, what happens roadkill? End up picks it up. We record it. We've had we have relatively good records, especially in the last few years. He said we try to pick it up within 24 hours. Sometimes it makes 48, but we pick it. You know, how does it get off the road? We drive around. We pick it up. We record it. So if you want to know the data, there's a gal in Carson City. I remember the name off the top of my head today. But, you know, that has this data. Many of the regions have very good data, depending on their individual policies within. But they're out there. And my understanding is they do the job. And uh, the data should be available in dot Carson City. Anybody else? Well. Like I said, I, I hope in the end uh, this only leads to better things for Nevada. I, I think it could hopefully get us some money, make our sagebrush habitat better, and be a benefit to everybody in the state. I, I do believe that in the end it could be a good thing. They just they brought something and maybe it will make our industry and ranching and our outdoorsmen even stronger together. and. And have a better product going forward. So that, that's my hope. And I, I think we can get there. Uh, no more comments. We'll move on to 7E legislative update. Ken Mayer and the and Commissioner McBeth. Ex, ex, ex uh, Chairman Mr. McBeth. Um, the report on Kim was that uh, she was dilated and in the process of. So. Um, we may have a baby here uh, next week or, or this weekend. Um, we uh, we submitted uh, two BDRs for approval, and they were both uh, made it through the Department of Administration and the budget approval. And those BDRs, and Rob's here can answer specific questions, uh, is the uh, State Lacey Act basically uh, is a, a bill to mirror what the Lacey Act, the Federal Lacey Act, to make it easier for us to deal with those kinds of cases. It has provision to make it unlawful to possess wildlife in Nevada, um, possess in Nevada any wildlife which was illegally acquired, hunted, taken, or transported from another state and allow state game wardens to investigate and recommend for prosecution in state courts similar to language in other states. Um, and the draft is pending with the governor review and final approval. Um, we. we uh, now, if we have a, a violate someone that violated law in another state, in Nevada, um, endow has got to go through the federal agent, and it's a lengthy process. Most states have a comparable act like this, and it, it made sense to do this. And Rob is here to answer any questions if you have specifically. The other is a, a boat lock cleanup uh, for stolen boat process and accident reporting thresholds. It amends the boat accident report threshold to match what is required by uh, the states uh, by the U.S. Coast Guard and adopts additional clarifying language on what the process for enforcing um, uh, defaced boat hulls, numbers, stolen boats, similar to motor vehicle language. Um, and it, it, it changed the, the dollar amount to make it m more um, uh, uh, similar to what it, what's going on here. $500 worth of damage, uh, you know, to, to, in today's world. So those are those are the two um, uh, BDRs that we we submitted. Um, if you have any questions on those, um, Rob can probably fill you in on the more of the details from a, from a law, for, law enforcement. Uh, hearing nothing, I guess the uh, wildlife 
uh, Commission's Legislative Committee uh, met on the 24th of July at 10 a.m. The, the draft uh, minutes are posted on our website, so you can see those. The next meeting is December 6th at 10 a.m. in Reno, unless we need something sooner. Um, the committee will um, uh, wait to make recommendations to support any or take any action until the department receives the governor approval on our, our BDRs, uh, the final approval, and for the legislative council bureau to prepare uh, bill language uh, for us. Uh, and then once those, the language of the bills in the background, we'll give that to the CABs and the commission and the public review and uh, make it easier uh, for everybody to understand. Uh, as far as uh, recent uh, events to put on your calendar, you know, we traditionally during the session have a, 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 a wildlife breakfast. And, you know, we've been in, uh, chained up in four-wheel drive uh, you know, trying to get to Carson and snowstorms. Um, so we've changed it to a, to a, a lunch. It'll be February 13th uh, at 1130 in the Legislative Building. And uh, we're looking, uh, Gil Yannick is with the Friends of Nevada's Wildlife is looking for folks to help sponsor financially uh, to, to, to pay for that. So um, I wanted to make everybody aware of that. <clears throat> and at the same day, we're going to have a sports persons conservation day at the legislature. So we're going to try to do a, something that's sports persons day at the legislature, and then we'll have the, the, uh, the luncheon. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that's the report. And you, you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> the committee met um, on uh, July 24th. And uh, uh, the committee is made up of uh, uh, myself uh, and Vice Chairman Drew. Uh, Chris McKenzie, former uh, chairman of the Wildlife Commission, uh, Tina Nappy, former uh, Wildlife Commissioner, conservation rep on the commission, and then Kyle Davis uh, with the, what is the name of his organization, the Conservation Sorry, Organization? Nevada Conservation League. Nevada Conservation League. Okay, Nevada Conservation League. Uh, a very experienced uh, committee, uh, I believe, and um, uh, which will be guiding, you know, the commission and reporting to the commission as, as we move forward. Um, the initial meeting was more to just kind of get an idea of what, what we might do. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we did have uh, kind of an overview of uh, uh, the important committees. Uh, we have Assembly of Natural Resources, Senate of Natural Resources, uh, uh, Assembly of Judiciary, and Senate Judiciary. Those are the main committees that we need to be keeping our eye on. We need to find out who are appointed to those committees. We've got elections and whatnot that are going to impact all of that. Uh, we need to find out who the chairman of those uh, uh, committees are. And so uh, I think we'll be keeping our eye on that. Um, uh, the potential issues that we uh, identified uh, as uh, things that, uh, based on what has happened in the last uh, year, uh, that we uh, uh, feel fairly confident we're going to be seeing are in the area of trapping, of course, uh, uh, potentially a uh, anything from outright ban we know that they're serving in on the 96 hour trap visitation statute as well as trap registration um, uh, as far as bear uh, the bear uh, issues uh, in nevada uh, uh, we uh, identified uh, potentially elimination of the bear hunt uh, and uh, one of the methods of hunting uh, using dogs as being potential uh, targets of legislation um, uh, also out of that, uh, out of all of this issues that have uh, occurred in trapping and uh, the bear hunt, uh, the, um, uh, some of the individuals that uh, have been uh, animal welfare advocates that have been pushing uh, uh, on those issues uh, have identified uh, uh, the makeup of the Wildlife Commission as a potential issue that they, they feel disenfranchised and uh, are getting represented. And so they, uh, they're looking to go after uh, the makeup of the commission. Uh, as well as the makeup of the county advisory boards. Um, and uh, they feel that they're weighted towards uh, sportsmen and sportsmen's interests. And, uh, and so uh, we're going to have to, uh, I think that's, in my, in my opinion, those last two are the most critical that we need to be keeping our eye on. Um, and so, uh, uh, like Ken indicated, uh, the next meeting is uh, December 6th. Uh, you know, as, as things start coming together, as we get closest, closer to the legislative session, I think that's the committee will then uh, uh, hopefully uh, come up with a game plan and, and recommend to this uh, commission what we what we should be doing. Uh, and uh, so, uh, 
Jeremy, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Not at this point. I think that's it. If there's any questions or, you know, after looking at the minutes, if anybody had any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. I think we'll find out a whole lot more here yeah. in the next few months. <laughs> it's only just beginning. All right. We'll move on to uh, agenda item number 7F, uh, wildlife disease update. And before we get go, come on up. Before we get started on this, uh, I'm really torn on this particular item because we do not have our ranching representative present today. Okay, Boyd. But I know that Boyd's here. So I know Boyd came specifically for this, but we don't have a ranching representative, and we don't have one of the presenters uh, listed on this item, JJ. I'm sure you can handle both sides, uh, but, uh, you know, I, 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 we will go forward with it, but we may need to give uh, Pete and JJ an update at the end of this and see if we need to address this issue again at some future point. Okay, for the record, I'm Perry Wolf, and I'm the wildlife veterinarian for Endow. And um, this is going to kind of be a 15,000 foot view of um, three wildlife diseases that we currently have identified in the state of Nevada, and one that we have not, but it seems to be of interest um, around the West, so we're going to touch on it. I'm saving that for last. Um, I had turned it off. There we go. This was working. There we go. Okay, so we're going to touch on pneumonia complex and bighorn sheep and just kind of give you an update of what we've been doing and seeing. Uh, deer hair loss syndrome, which is an um, uh, emerging disease in um, Nevada. It's been recognized in other states in the West. Um, bovine virus, diarrhea virus, which is um, seen for the first time in wildlife in Nevada, and then hydatta disease, which we do not, is not in the state, but is of cons general concern. So we'll quickly talk, go over some of the um, pneumonia complex issues in bighorn sheep, and I apologize, we have to get down a little bit into kind of some of the basic stuff about the disease. Um, it is a multi-factor disease, and uh, the primary players are really kind of boiling down now um, to two major bacteria. Um, bacteria in the Pasteuraceae family, uh, Mannheimia hemolytica, Bibersteinia trellosi, and Pasteurella multosida, which if anybody here uh, deals routinely with cattle of any sort, they know that these are the main, some of the main players in shipping fever pneumonia, which is a big Sorry. disease issue in uh, domestic cattle. And then also the other primary player um, that's really kind of come out uh, in the last maybe eight years or so, especially with some new technology, um, but seems to be playing a fairly uh, another significant role as a bacteria mycoplasma ova pneumoniae. And what we know about that is that both bighorn sheep, in fact most ruminants, um, and domestic sheep and domestic goats carry pastorella species in the oropharynx in the back of their throat. Uh, normally that's part of the normal flora. And when they've done comparative studies between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep, what they found is that the pastorella species that are carried predominantly by domestic sheep are uh, Mannheimia hemolytica, is the organism, the pastorella that they culture most frequently, versus uh, Bibersteinia trellosi, which is the one that's most frequently cultured from uh, the pharyngeal, oral pharyngeal area of bighorn sheep. And again, many strains of Mannheimia hemolytica and also uh, Bibersteinia trellosi, but Mannheim hemolytica is kind of the bad player, so it gets the most press, um, produce these toxins called leukotoxins, and that's part of the bacteria's strategy, and, and they, you know, it's sort of like their MO for getting their job done, is they make these leukotoxins, and this has been very, very well studied in the, in the cattle industry and in involving pneumonia in um, domestic ruminants. And it's something that's ongoing and, and uh, a lot of money and time and effort has gone into understanding these leukotoxins and how they um, work on the host and how they interact between the bacteria. 
what they've discovered and is that bighorn sheep probably because they never evolved on the landscape um, with these types of um, bacteria with this Mannheimi hemolytica that produces these leukotoxins that when they test them they test the moms they test babies they just do not produce antibodies to these leukotoxins to protect themselves to the same degree as a domestic sheep would so and even with between domestic cattle domestic sheep bighorn sheep and doll sheep they found out that varying species are more sensitive to different leukotoxins. Cattle are less sensitive to leukotoxins than domestic sheep are, and then bighorn sheep and doll sheep are even more sensitive, and they just don't produce the antibodies to protect themselves. So that is why when bighorn sheep, if they're exposed to strains of pastorella, primarily Mannheimia hemolytica, although they have identified some of the Biberstina trehalosi strains that also can cause disease, that have high leukotoxin production, and not all of these strains have high leukotoxin production, that can lead to uh, fatal pneumonias in bighorn sheep. And certainly, this is one of the um, animals, that, uh, a lamb that was out of the um, Ruby Mountains in East Humboldt's die off. And again, if any of you have ever dealt with sick cows, uh, seeing them when they've been necropsied, you can see the, um, the dark black looking lung there, which is full of pneumonia. And there's some yellow there that's fibrin, and it causes a severe fibrinonecrotic pneumonia and um, leads to death of the animal. So what's another, what we've recognized and what's being recognized around the West is another primary player is this mycoplasma ovipneumoniae. And it's a um, bacteria that's carried in domestic sheep and goats. A lot of different species have their own mycoplasma. We have a mycoplasma. Cattle have mycoplasma. There's various mycoplasma species out there. What this does is it causes, basically it causes the security and cleaning system in the respiratory tract to, to go on strike. And, and we all have these little ciliary brushes that keep brushing all of the bad stuff that we suck down into our tracheas every minute. It keeps flushing them out. And what this bacteria does is it causes that mechanism to just kind of go limp. And so then it's sort of like a free-for-all down into the respiratory tract. And it basically allows these other bacteria to come in and kind of set up and have a field day. And that's what's bad about the mycoplasma. <clears throat> so it can cause, um, mycoplasma in domestic sheep and goats can cause problems in lambs. There is reports, especially out of New Zealand, where there can be pneumonia in lambs, although it tends not to be a big cause of death in domestic sheep. I mean, certainly the pastorellas are really recognized as more of a cause of death in domestic species than uh, mycoplasma ovipneumoniae. And what we're beginning to see in, in bighorns, and spe especially in lambs, is it can cause fact, it can cause pneumonia in these animals, and they think in lambs that that maybe by itself it can cause death, but it tends to just cause illness, fevers, coughing, nasal discharge, um, but that it really needs one of another bacteria, most commonly Pasteurella, but when they've looked at culturing out some of these pneumonias, they found a whole host of other bacteria, including some, um, some of the anaerobic bacteria. But most commonly, you're going to find Mycoplasma ovipneumoniae plus one of the other uh, Pasteurellas. And it's not necessarily Mannheimia hemolytica, what we've cultured most frequently in some of our pneumonias where we felt that the mycoplasma has played a huge role is Pasteurella multocida, which is, does not tend to be a big um, uh, leukotoxin producer. So and now when they're doing surveys in bighorn sheep herds, um, serological surveys of bighorn sheep herds across the West, they're finding that many of these herds that have evidence that they have antibodies and have been exposed to um, mycoplasma ovipneumoniae tend to have a history of respiratory disease. Not in all cases, but that's something that's being borne out. So since pneumonia complex in bighorn sheep is a complex to multi-factor disease, we do appreciate some what we consider secondary players. Um, we look for some of the other respiratory viruses that are common in ruminants. What's been reported in the literature, not that I can say that we've appreciated in Nevada, but what's been appreciated and, 
and um, documented in some other states is that PI3 and um, BRSV, which are two other respiratory viruses commonly seen in uh, domestic ruminants, that they can, can, can cause morbidity, usually end up causing um, coughing and snotty nose. And you see maybe some sick animals, primarily youngsters, um, but that, that's not necessarily associated with a die-off. Uh, lungworms have also been reported to be contributors. Again, um, most of the, of the area of Nevada is very inhospitable to and internal parasites in general, and we only have a few populations where we even appreciate small numbers of lungworms in our bighorn sheep herds, and we have not ever um, determined that that's a primary player of pneumonia in these in our animals. And then there's been a lot of um, question about nutritional issues, selenium levels and copper levels, and there's been many papers published, but nobody's, nobody's really been able to make a good tie between them. We, we're not sure what the normal selenium and copper levels in, are in some of these um, livestock species, but we do have a lot of data, and, and there's some recent papers out of California where we're comparing at least some of our values to what they're seeing in um, comparable desert bighorn sheep herds in, in uh, California. So secondary players may contribute to disease but rarely are the primary cause of a die-off, but they, you might find them incidentally. So what we've been working on is basically um, collecting some, using some new technology. People that have been catching and working on bighorn sheep have been sampling bighorn sheep for ever since they've been catching them. Um, and, you know, I keep hearing from Mike Cox every day, we've been sampling for 25 years and what does it all mean? Um, and what, there's a lot of new technology out there, and I think that it's um, basically looking at, set, rather than looking at antibody titers and the presence or absence of a lot of these bacteria, they're now drilling down to the genetic level. So not only can we say that it's uh, Mannheimia hemolytica, but even some of the old Mannheimia hemolyticas that they cultured five years ago, ten years ago, now they're finding out genetically that it's not Mannheimia hemolytica, it's a different strain of Mannheimia, it's a ruminalis or something like that. So we're re a lot of states are re-looking at some of their old isolates and actually going down at a genetic level, comparing relatedness of them. So a lot of this new technology is being used to actually really drill down into the specific organisms and figure out their relatedness um, in groups of sheep and between groups of sheep. So we're, we're starting down that, that pathway. Um, one of the things that we've also decided that's very important is to sample across time because things change on the landscape and many times we have an, a herd that goes through a die-off yet we have really no idea what the status of that herd was pathogen profile wise before the die-off. There might have been samples taken but they were just some antibody titers or they might not have, they may not have had um, samples taken at that time and also there's new tests that are out there so we can we we found that we really need to be looking at them over a period of time even though we might have already had some data on them so our goal is kind of to try to really look at creating a herd pathogen profile um, one so that we understand the status of the herds in Nevada two that we don't move disease around um, they've looked at some uh, where they've gone back and looked at isolates and relatedness of isolates in some herds in Colorado and they felt that there's some strains of Bibristinia trehalosi that they have associated with poor, poorly performing herds in Colorado and they feel that they may have moved that bacteria around when they have done some translocations with some of their animals in the state of Colorado. So that's um, something that we want to make sure that we understand what's there so that we don't put potentially disease into a herd that's naive or take naive animals and put them into a herd that might have some already have some issues going on. So that's just basic good animal husbandry um, and we're trying to look at that. This slide is a little bit busy but this is kind of what we're trying to do um, and uh, we're, we'll break it down. It's, it, this is kind of the clustered version. But basically what we're doing is looking at these, what we consider probably the important pathogens that we have and figuring out where the herds are and what they have. 
and um, it's a little difficult to see. And then the brown shaded areas are, are herds that we um, either have had a historical die-off where we can actually get old tissues and go back and retest them using new technology, or where we've had a current die-off and we are um, using, we have, we can use the latest technology to, to figure out what's there. And one of the things that is occurring, and the, the blue circles are areas where we have um, had astray domestics, either domestic goats or domestic sheep that have, sheep that have been in the herds um, that we've gone ahead and been able to sample. But one of the things that comes up is that the top red dot, which is mycoplasma ovinomoniae confirmed by PCR, which means the actual DNA from the organism is, pre is present, not that they've just been exposed to it, starts corresponding um, very closely with a lot of our herds where we've had um, die-offs and we have tissues and samples available that we can look at that. So I, I feel that that combined with some of the other bacteria is definitely, um, definitely an organism that, that can cause some disease. So we're continuing um, our surveillance efforts uh, we, with capture and transplant. Um, and we've been, uh, we've been lucky enough actually to work with a, a number of other um, veterinary schools, people that, uh, from the Midwest that are they're very much into, they live and they just love these little individual pastorella bacteria and we're looking at being able to actually make our samples um, mean more where they're just not culturing them for the bacteria. But again, hopefully we can kind of uh, use techniques that don't just re require plating them out on a petri dish but actually can um, run a whole sequence and we can with a with a very small amount of money and with a very short period of time we can get a whole uh, profile from that animal um, and there's a lot of uh, there, we're having some good partnerships with that um, we're looking at um, hunter harvested animals especially focusing on some of our problem herds or our suspected problem herds and asking hunters when they're out there if they wouldn't mind collecting lung tissue um, to look at for evidence of disease and also uh, liver tissue to look for uh, trace mineral analysis. And what we're doing is targeting high risk herds uh, that have potential contact with domestic sheep or goats. Um, poor performances for unknown reasons. There's, there's herds that we know that just didn't take off and we don't know why they didn't take off. But one of the things that we may be able to fairly easily do um, either through uh, with hunter harvested surveillance uh, is to be able to say, okay, I can at least rule out that we're not seeing this. Can't tell you what the problem is, but I can tell you what we don't have there. And then also that we do have herds that we just have little or no sampling history on them, and we just want to make sure that we know exactly what's going on with those, with those groups. Should I go through the whole thing and then everyone can ask questions, or do people I, want to ask questions I, now? Questions. Questions. Questions? Yes. Yes. Maybe it's premature, but um, first of all, this has been a long time coming. It's definitely helped me understand a little better the dynamics. And, you know, look forward to learning a little bit more. But are you suggesting that there's potential for um, in, in getting an understanding that? Of the, of the herds. Is there, is there an opportunity to build up the antibodies in these animals? There is. Um, there is. They've tried over the years to use some of the vaccines for pasteurella um, that were available commercially for cattle. And that was, a lot of that work was done in Colorado and it pretty much <laughs> failed miserably. Uh, mainly and then um, Dr. Shree, who's done some uh, bighorn research out at, up at WSU, Washington State University, um, came up with a uh, vaccine for PATH for Mannheimia hemolytica that in a controlled setting did provide protection. The big rub with vaccinating wildlife is usually, you know, there's no vaccine that's a single administration, so you have to booster them. And the big the issue I have is that if you if you protect them against past uh, Mannheimia hemolytica, that we're seeing animals that are suffering from a pneumonia and potentially dying that that have mycoplasma ovinomoniae, which there is no vaccine for, 
plus Pasteur Elamaltosida, which is a fairly benign, it's, it's a more benign Pasteurella. It certainly can be involved in disease, but it's not known to be the killer that Mannheimia hemolytica, some strains of Mannheimia hemolytica can be. Certainly we want to do everything, you know, stress of any sort, uh, bad nutrition, hard winters, all of those types of things are a stress on all animals, wildlife or domestic species. So the more we can minimize that, Yes, they may have better antibodies, but we're not specifically creating antibodies to these diseases. So the whole vaccination thing has not, you know, it's easier to vaccinate against rabies because carnivores will go snuffling along the ground and pick up a peanut butter bait. But, you know, bighorn sheep are kind of fussy and picky and aren't going to go pick up bait. The whole concept's interesting to me because, you know, I think that we've all probably fallen into the trap of thinking Die-offs that we have when you know, I mean, it's, it's good to hear it. And my understanding is that it's just part of your natural microflora that's in your body's already it's just there. Just well, like, just like most of us having cold right now, it's just you know, it's just a level that, that the body tolerates. And it sounds like um, you know, and it, to some extent, it sounds like the natural populations here, the wild populations, have had some progression, maybe over time evolution, because you know, you've got animals up north and all sheep and things that. Have Well, no, the, I mean, the, they don't, the, the bighorn sheep, the reason that contact with domestics has usually led to, has often led to disease, pneumonia, and often fatal pneumonia, is because they don't, the pastorella and, man, and mycoplasma ova pneumoniae in domestic species, they, they've evolved with those on the European continent. <laughs> and there was never a domestic species like that on the North American continent. And that's one of the theories that why they think that when they mix together, there is a die-off because the bighorn sheep do not produce antibodies to the same level as a domestic sheep would to the pastorella bacteria. They, they carry Pasteurella bacteria normally, but it's usually the, the Biberstenia trehalosi, which tends to have less leukotoxin activity. <laughs> and bighorn sheep do not normally carry uh, Mycoplasma ova pneumoniae. That's specifically a disease of domestic sheep and domestic goats. So we're still advocating separation of domestic sheep and goats from bighorn sheep, because usually when they mix, bad things tend to happen. Not always, but then one of the things that I think that, that is hard for us all to understand is that there's, just like E. coli, there's a couple of strains of E. coli that if you eat it raw on a hamburger, it could, could, could kill you. But there's hundreds of strains of E. coli. There's many, many strains of pastorella. There's many, many different levels of leukotoxins and you have to get the right strain of leukotoxin and you have to get the right strain of, of Mannheimia hemolytica or the right strain of Mycoplasma ova pneumoniae to get together to cause disease. So that's why I think that there are certainly areas where there's domestic sheep and bighorn sheep that have been in contact where nothing has happened. But the majority of the time, it does tend to lead to a pneumonia event and in the worst case scenario, an all age die off. And I think, and what is most devastating with many of these all age die offs and what is incompletely understood at this point in time is that the subsequent year lamb production, the ewes get pregnant, they produce lambs, lambs die probably at about three to four months of age, they get pneumonia and die. And that is probably due to potentially due to mycoplasma ova pneumoniae coupled with the pastorella, but it's incompletely worked out at this point in time. Any other questions?
don't mix the two together? Okay. Okay, so the next topic was going to be deer, deer hair loss syndrome. Would you like me to go ahead and skip that? I can. Do you want me to blow through it really fast? Listen to either one of those guys. That's a genetic. I can. I can skip it or go through it really fast. Should I just skip it? Okay. These are the cool pictures, but that's all right. Okay, so we'll go on to BVD, and um, bovine virus, diarrhea virus is, is basically worldwide. Um, it can infect all ungulates, meaning all two-toed, so not only um, the bovidae species, but also pigs. So it doesn't do horses. Doesn't, unfortunately, it won't affect wild horses, but it will affect pigs and cattle. Um, it's primarily a disease of cattle in that that has been the that has been the species that has been most impacted as far as economic value with the animal, and that's where the majority of the money has been spent uh, researching it. And the reason it is studied so heavily in cattle is that um, it causes reproductive loss is one of the major components which reproductive loss in a cattle operation is obviously going to be a huge economic loss. So there's there's a lot of incentive to understand better the disease. Yes? Sorry. <clears throat> oh, I could walk all around the room? Okay. So what we know about it in cattle, and I'm going to use cattle as the model because that's where the majority of the, uh, of the research has been done, is that when, if, if you're acutely infected, that you get the disease, as an adult or as a calf already on the, the ground, you can, you can get sick and then shed the virus. Just like if we get a cold, we get sick and we shed the virus. Which is pretty much the MO with most viruses. Um, however, what makes BVD different and, and a very difficult but very clever virus is that the main source of transmission of this virus between uh, animals is through a, what is called a PI or a persistently infected individual. And what happens is that if I'm, if I'm infected with BVD and I'm in contact with, with somebody that's pregnant in the first trimester of their pregnancy, what happens is the mother gets pregnant, is pregnant, she gets the virus, she maybe has a little fever, has a drop in milk production, doesn't feel good for a day. But what happens is, is the virus goes into the fetus, and because the fetus is not at a stage where it has an immune system yet, it just takes the virus in as part of its body and never recognizes that virus as being anything foreign. So if that fetus is carried to term and is born, then it is basically a typhoid mary. It's loaded with virus, and it sheds virus from every body orifice for, the life, for its life. Some of these animals can die very young. Some of these animals can die, can mature to adults and, and be seemingly normal and healthy individuals, but they're sort of super shedders. And that is, that's basically the animal that's the most dangerous are these PI animals. And that goes for any species that's infected with BBD. So that's what we know about cattle. The clinical disease, um, if, if, if an animal becomes infected, they may have no signs of clinical disease. Um, it's very immunosuppressive though, so it can often be associated with respiratory disease 
and, and because it has diarrhea in its name, it can also be associated with gastrointestinal disease and, and some other uh, less common diseases. Again, the biggest problem is, is that when these PI animals are in with pregnant cows, um, if they're uh, infected during the first trimester, they can create a, a PI animal or can result in fetal loss. And then if the, if the cow is infected during the second and third trimester, you can lead to fetal loss, congenital birth defects, you can have an, a healthy uh, calf, or you can have a weak calf. So again, it comes back to a production disease, which is, which is very um, devastating for the economics of the, of the herd. They've been doing um, a lot of studies on white-tailed deer. They've been finding some, um, looking for uh, the, how the disease uh, is, is transmitted in the epidemiology of white-tailed deer. Most of it's done, been done in experimental studies in the East Coast, um, and they found out that as far as the infection, the clinical disease, the production of a PI animal, it's very similar to that in cattle. What we know about some of the species that we have out here in Nevada is that there's been a single report of virus isolated from a bighorn sheep that was sick um, in Wyoming and also a, a mule deer that was sick in, in Wyoming and both of those animals uh, I think presented with pneumonia and were basically poor doers. Uh, there was a report in the literature of a persistently infected mountain goat that was in a captive situation in a zoo. <clears throat> and then there is very, very few reports of the epidemiology of the disease in, in free-ranging wildlife species. So what, what kind of triggered this all in us looking at BVD in Nevada was that during the, um, in the, the map is, and I don't, do we have a pointer? It's on that. It's at the end of that. It's at the end of this. Okay. Oh, right there. Okay. So this is the northeastern corner of Nevada. Uh, this is the Pequops. This is the East Humboldt's, the Ruby Mountains, and then, um, the rest of Area 10 down here, and then this is the Simpson Park Range. So just to orient you, so in 2009, 2010, when we had a die-off of bighorn sheep in the East Humboldt's and the Ruby Mountains, um, it was a classic respiratory disease with the pneumonia. We found Pastorella, we found Mycoplasma ova pneumoniae, but then when we went back and looked at some of the serum serology, we found out that there was a very high percentage of our animals. We tested 34 animals, bled them, and 76 of them were positive with very, very, very high titers to BVD. Uh, at the same time, we had tested a few mountain goats, and all three of those animals were also positive. Then at the time, we were focused on the fact that this was more of the pastorella pneumonia, so we really didn't focus that much on BVD because asking other colleagues, they didn't seem all that impressed by it. Um, then when we came back and re-looked at some of these animals in 2012, um, we retested them and again tested 26 uh, bighorn sheep out of that area and found out that 80% of them still had these persistently high titers. Um, we had one mountain goat kid uh, that we picked up in 2011 that was tested and was positive. And then we also bled some more animals in um, 2012, and 70% of those were positive, except for some that were bled farther down that were negative. Uh, what really kind of piqued our interest is we started a large mule deer project where we looked at um, three populations of mule deer in 2011. We looked at uh, mule deer here in Area 10. We looked at mule deer here in the Simpson Park Range, and then we also sampled a large group of mule deer in the Carson Tahoe area. What we found was that 80 animals were tested, 48% were positive in Area 10 in 2011, and 11% were positive in the Simpson Parks. None of the Tahoe animals were positive at all. Then we came back in 2012 and um, added, tested these ranges again, looked at collared more deer, and then also added the Pequops and again found um, fairly high uh, numbers of BVD positive animals, and again, the Tars Carson range was negative. And then when we've looked at all of the bighorn sheep around the rest of Nevada, all of them are negative for BVD. We don't have any titers. And it would make the most sense because this is um, also where we have the majority of 
um, cattle operations in the state because that's where a lot of the great habitat is for raising cattle. So what do we know about BVD virus in, in Nevada? Um, we've been working with the National Veterinary Services Lab, a, a veterinarian there who's a researcher there who's, who's um, very well versed in BVD, uh, both working in domestic species and also um, looking at some um, deer species, and that we've isolated a virus from three of our bighorn sheep that were involved in the 2010 uh, die off and one mountain goat kid that had been found on the mountain in 2011. Um, the, the fact that over uh, three years of sampling or two years of sampling we've had persistently high titers in mule deer and in bighorn sheep and mountain goat indicates that there is a continued exposure to the virus um, with those three species because when they've looked at most other, if you take away the, the source of the infection, the, our antibody titers will eventually go down. Our titers, we have a couple of animals that were tested in 2010 and 2012, and they've continued to have very high titers. So we feel there's a continued exposure. Um, the theory now is that we suspect that there was an adaptation to a strain of BVD that potentially was circulating or was uh, in a a PI cow, most likely, um, that has adapted, has gotten into the wildlife and adapted to those and is causing, um, causing the presence of this virus circulating around at least the bighorn sheep and the mountain goats, because those are the only two species that we have isolated virus from. Um, at this point, we don't know if it's the same virus isolate that's in the mule deer. We have no, we don't have any information on that. Um, respiratory disease and poor offspring survival has been documented in our uh, big Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and our mountain goats in the Ruby Mountains and the East Humboldt. Um, but that also can occur from uh, this from the respiratory viruses, we don't know that it's related to BVD. We don't know that it's not related to BVD. We just don't, we don't have any information to support that one way or the other. Uh, there has been no clinical disease appreciated in um, any of the mule deer uh, in the Pequops, in the um, Area 10, or in the Simpson Parks. And then the impact of BVD on Area 10, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, mountain goats, and mule deer is unclear. So at this point in time, we really just, we, we just are on the very, very tip of even understanding of what we have in those three species. Um, so it's very difficult to make a definitive statement because we don't, we just don't know. We don't have enough information. Okay. So if we just stick to nice red-eared sliders, life would be so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions from the commission? Or, Boyd, do you want to come up and say anything? Okay. Yeah. Some, yeah, some absolutely. Comments. For the record, my name is Boyd Spratling. I'm a veterinarian that practices in, in Elko County, and I live at the base of, of the East Humboldt. So I'm well, uh, you know have a pretty good exposure to that particular area. The, the comment, I'm, I don't disagree with anything that Dr. Wolf has said. I would like to point a couple things out, I mean, or, or emphasize a couple things that she did say. We're talking about bighorn sheep populations with any disease proce process in any species. We look at pathogens, we look at nutrition, but one thing that is so critical to all of it is stress level. When we get stressed ourselves, our normal cortisone levels that are secreted from our adrenal glands goes up and that it basically suppresses the immune system. So stress level in combination with exposure to pathogen and perhaps you know either good nutrition or poor nutrition especially in relation to to selenium levels and zinc levels and copper levels but we have to be careful if copper can become toxic easily in bighorn sheep. All those things are what cause a disease outbreak and then we get the die off. So there's no doubt, I, mean, I think a common misconception with, with a lot of sportsmen is that if we don't have any exposure to domestics, then we don't have any pathogens and there will be no disease. That is you know, simply untrue. 
you know, the, the pathogens, as, as Dr. Wolf said, are resident in the oropharynx of, of bighorn populations. So the pathogens are there, they can get exposed to some more pathogenic uh, bacteria over time. But because you reduce that, if you eliminate total exposure between bighorns and domestic populations, you will still have die-offs. And looking at, at data back in the 90s when I was on the commission, we saw the, whole, the bighorn sheep that were brought in from Canada had